Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What's going on, everybody? Welcome yeah. to episode eight of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. Coming off Hold after, uh, after, thanks. Hold on. Gonna, gonna in interrupt that here so you can slide. Gotta noisily slide your collection of keys out of the way. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. We, hey, we are the Collecting Keys Podcast. I just, you that know, is. maybe I need to get a wall, a mural of keys. Yeah, it's a, it's a landlord problem right there. Yeah. You, you, need, you need like a room. Like, have you ever, I've seen like a couple guys, they like flex that if they have like a pretty large portfolio, they'll have like a key room at their office <laughs> where they have like a giant like pegboard just full of keys. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a good flex. I moved towards lock boxes, but I just have those as spares just in case. Yeah. Right. But they're obviously unorganized right now. It's just a pile. So yeah. um, who knows <laughs> what they all go to, but like the lock box on the house is usually pretty good. But then what happens is some contractor loses it and you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah. You'll never, I mean, you'll never figure out what all those go to. We're going to go to every property with that whole bundle and just like try every single one and see what works. Well, no, see, some of them are well organized. Like these have, you know, I've got like the little thing with the address on it, right? And so some of them, you know, some of them are decently organized. <laughs> it's just the other ones that I, yeah, you're right. Some of them are going to the garbage. I used to have even more than that, but, you know, my daughter likes playing with them. So I keep some of the loose ones around. Yeah. Do you think it'd be beneficial to swap everything over to like the, the smart locks? I mean, actually, I mean, it would, right? If you think about it, it's be kind of expensive. Swap everything over to like the smart locks and then between tenants, I mean, you can just basically swap out the key code. You don't even give them keys. You just give them like a new code. Yeah. You know, and then when, uh, when they leave and a new one comes in, you just generate a new one. Then, I mean, you don't even have to go to the property. Then you send in the cleaner that way between them. You send in the handyman. You can even, I wonder if you could even do it like we're having a walkthrough. Um, here is, you know, if you want to walk through like on Saturday, here's your 30 minute window your code is this and it expires after 30 minutes. So that way you know who's in and out in case everybody messes up your property. Yeah. You know, I mean like the, we use the, um, I, I like, I like quick set smart key stuff, uh, but we use their on our Airbnbs, the digital ones that can, you can hold up like 250 codes, um, which I don't know how many locks you can have on their app. We've got two. Um, the challenge that I've, I've kind of thought about, especially with Airbnbs is like, what if the batteries run out? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you, maybe that pair with a lock box for the tenants to be able to access, but then you're kind of losing security with your locks box. If like, I don't ever give tenants like lock box codes, cause I don't want to go yeah. and change it after they've had it. Right. For I've sure. got, I've got one code for all of our properties. And so it's probably not the most secure way to do it, but if we have a contractor that we fire, I always have to change, which is also yeah. a pain in the ass. Well, it's probably even less secure that that's also the same as your pin code for your debit card. <laughs> it's, your it's, the only, it's the only thing I remember. Your car, you have your car, truck code's yeah. exactly the same. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Yes. That's the truth. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, I mean, for, for Airbnb, that's no brainer. But I wonder even like yeah. for like long-term rentals. I mean, why can't yeah. we structure it the same way, right? Instead of, then instead of having to do the open house BS process, we can just give people like a temporary code that only lasts a short period of time. Yeah. You know, and I, I was actually talking to uh, Sam Barr about that. He, that's what he has on all those properties. Oh, and really? then he has all those things you just said, Hey, the cleaner gets a code, this person, they all have different unique codes because then yeah. you can just change that one person's code. And so he does like remote everything, you know? And so it's definitely, it's worth, it's worth doing, I think yeah. um, as we scale. So Interesting. You should look into that. Cause I mean, is any look right? Like if you have to change the locks or anything on it, would that cost like a hundred something bucks? Uh, no, it would cost the one we buy is like, I think it's like around 200 bucks and then paying a guy, oh. you know, 50 bucks to go change it or whatever. So it's an expensive end endeavor though. One thing I'd be curious about is, you know, when well, you don't, the, when you have the, the fancy one you're talking about though, that's that much. Yeah, if you just, I guess if you just got, because yeah, that's true. So the ones I want for Airbnb are connected to Wi-Fi, right? Because I want to yeah. be able to know when people are accessing or not accessing. So for a regular one, 
gosh, I don't know though, actually, if with like a hand punch, if you could actually do um, multiple different codes, I, I think you might have to have a smart one. Yeah. Any- so yeah, the, the smart one, then I wonder if you get ones that are tied to like cellular. Yeah. And so you can probably mean, pay a fee. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe if one of our listeners knows they can hit us up and tell us the best way to do this. Cause as you know, we're troubleshooting on, on the podcast. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. yeah, I don't, you know, it's like hard to find time to figure this stuff out, but you, if you do, it's like you unlock a whole nother two hours of your week or whatever, when you can find ways to automate shit. Yeah. That's always the challenge too. And I mean, also, I think that those sort of things are why people say, you know, like residential real estate isn't scalable because mm-hmm. there's, you know, all those, facets to it right but i'm like i don't know does it really have to be that different than having a a large apartment unit if you you know you can organize it the same um and uh uh oh i lost you where'd you go i'm back (laughs) that was weird yeah sorry about that it's been internet connections all day here today james is in the meeting this morning was having a hell of a time with his internet um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you structure it with like the same sort of infrastructure, I don't understand why it can't be the same totally. as having like it all yeah. in a singular apartment, like a singular building. Right. I mean, honestly, if you have 40 single family units, all which have their own process and you have like product management in house, is that really that different from having an apartment complex? It's funny. I wonder if you could even sell that on like a cap rate basis because it is like a full portfolio similar to how you would sell like an apartment complex. Yeah. Yeah. You can. I've looked at some deals like that where it's basically like, oh, really? yeah. Um, I was looking at a few years ago, a student rental portfolio right by mine. And of course he was selling them at like a four cap. So it just didn't make sense for what I needed <laughs> to do, but it was like, I mean, a great, great portfolio of like 10 quality properties in a great neighborhood. Yeah. And so on that, yeah, sold it as, and they listed it on the MLS actually as a portfolio. He wanted Right. Wanted a lot. I think it was like he wanted like three million for him or something like that, which yeah. it was actually back you know a few years ago it was like a reasonable price. But then at that time, it's worth eight now, dude. Right at then, I mean, it's still a four cap now. But at then, at that point, it was like a four cap too. But um, yeah. Anyhow, yeah, that's kind of how a lot of folks do it. I was actually listening to a podcast where they were talking about a guy like that's how he he actually markets um and looks for specifically portfolios and and kind of review and the way he was talking about his reviewing process was looking at them as you know anything else any other asset right you're gonna look at the the cap rate and all that sort of stuff but because he's marketing to hey 50 houses i want to buy your 50 houses right Mm -hmm. so and then he flips them wholesales them to other people oh okay so like like is that on like an individual basis or as like the whole portfolio the whole portfolio like he has investors and he basically goes out and finds folks like us that have, you know, medium to large size residential single family portfolios and maybe mixed in with some small, um, you know, apartment buildings and all that. And then basically he, but he's not wholesaling in the sense he's just collecting a brokerage fee on each house as he sells them into their, mm-hmm. his investor pool. Oh yeah. So actually he's selling each house individually, but like selling the, the package as like a whole, no. but he's not selling like the entire package person uh that's a good question it, he made it sound like he was he was selling it all um as a package but the way he instead of trying to collect a wholesale fee um he was you know which is which could change right can grow or shrink depending on your investors he was just saying i just want a three percent fee on each of these properties or the whole portfolio in general gotcha. which gotcha. which i felt like he's leaving a lot of money on the table doing it that way but he seemed to be happy with the system yeah so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, right? Like there's never a perfect way to do it. I was actually having that conversation with uh, um, one of my, my GoBros from GoBuns this morning where he was looking at this deal and, you know, he's talking about like, he's not sure if it's going to be a perfect burr, he's not sure he wants to do it, all that sort of stuff. You know, basically like, I think a lot of people, you know, they're worried about leaving money on the table or worried about something being perfect so they don't pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. And that's the greatest way to just not do anything ever. Right. Yeah. Right. That's like saying that I'm going to, I'm going to hunt for my dinner, but I only want to eat unicorns. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, you're never yeah. going to eat anything. Right. Yeah. So, um, I know. And, and even like in our, our, um, in Ryan's group, like in our mastermind and stuff, there's so many people that won't do it because they are my, our, our, our main competitors in town. I talked to them and they said they won't keep a property if it's not a perfect burr. 
Not mm-hmm. a, if you can't perfectly refinance out all of their money, they won't keep it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, you're missing up on so much upside. Imagine all those properties that you passed on two years ago. Mm-hmm. If you bought those now, you guys collectively collectively would have, you know, millions and millions of dollars more wealth yep. and cash flow. And you wouldn't be writing fat checks, the IRS, or you should be able to appreciate all that. Right. Yeah. It goes back to like, I think that comment I made last week, it's like, are you an, are you an entrepreneur or are you just an investor? Right. Like if you feel like you're a real estate entrepreneur, but you're limiting because you're only looking at one metric. I mean, that's just, in my opinion, just investing Mm -hmm. in like one niche that you're going to do. And that's bird deals. Right. And if you're just looking for the perfect bird deal to your point, you're missing out on other opportunities, many other opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then people get caught up on that, which I mean, I guess if you're exactly right, if you're not doing a lot of transactions, you obviously want to get the most bang for your buck. But obviously, because we have the ability to generate more capital Mm -hmm. at like a decently rapid rate, if stuff's coming together, we can be a little bit more loose with stuff. If we're looking at that land deal and we like weren't sure if we're going to be able to assign it, which we were able to get it assigned over the weekend. We were like, oh, worst case, we'll just buy it and then like figure it out. It's yeah. only 20 grand. It's like, well, it's kind of a fucked up mentality because that's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, when it's it's not that hard to make 20 grand um, in our business, but, but also, yeah, yeah, it is a good chunk of money. I mean, when we first started out, we would have been like, oh, no, no way. Let's not even Dude, do this. <laughs> man, remember, remember the first assignment we ever got? Yeah. It was like 7,500 bucks. Yeah. And we were like high-fiving. Yeah, yeah. We were in the in the front yard of that Coza property, yeah. like leaping around. <laughs> like, yeah, we did yeah. it. You know? <laughs> we, boy, have we come a long way. <laughs> right? No, no kidding. Not anything like that. I'm like, God damn it. It's like, that's like disappointing. I know. Yeah. Um, but I know it's funny. Um, I was uh, going over stuff with our um this was like the economy as a whole right now and the world is such a weird freaking place right now but i'm all it was also reinforcing the why i like real estate stuff so much because you know see i'm sure you saw what the market did last thursday and friday yeah after the new omicron variant i know and also too i'm just like where do they come up they're just gonna keep picking random ass names like right. please just like have some sort of order to it i know I don't know if you're, you've probably never watched Futurama, but I used to, yeah. There's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, the evil aliens, they come from Omicron yeah. Percy I ate. I did. I was like the only thing I could think of. I before. did not remember right. that, but that's funny. <laughs> well, and it's like, here was my initial instinct. I was like, it came out of South Africa. A lot more weird shit comes out of Africa than just this. <laughs> right. I know. Just nonstop. I mean, and, but then, you know, that, that, like, just like a whisper of that in the news and then markets start tanking, you know, and, and people start to freak out. <clears throat> And I mean, kind of the weird spot that we're in is I feel like it has been like short term trading across like cryptocurrency and stocks, especially like in the past little bit with like all the GameStop and the AMC stuff has now been drilled into the financial society. So now there's like this badge of honor where they're like, oh, I'm I'm holding the dip like I'm buying the dip. Yeah, yeah. You know. Whereas I, I feel like in the past, everyone was like, oh, my retirement's going away. I need to panic sell. Right. And that's like what leads to a lot of the the big recessions. But I feel like now with how easy it is and how cheap it is for people to make their own trades and also too with the abundance of, you know, as many people as have struggled over the past, you know, couple of years now, there's a lot of people that have done extremely well and are sitting on lots of cash. They're just waiting for every opportunity to buy like that. Yeah. You know, but I, I was thinking about that. And I was like, it's really interesting because I don't know what it would take to trigger a major sell-off, you know, like a major stock market recession, like we've seen in the past, you know, because even if there's like a, like a a big critical thing that happens, it's all people ready to buy, you know, but at the same time, the one thing I do like, like that's what scares me about it is you don't know and it's impossible to really predict. The one thing that I can know about real estate is even if the real estate values go down and like, you know, inflation goes crazy and our dollar is now worth nothing, a house will still be worth a house. Right. At the end of the day. Yeah. You know, and there's still people that like need homes and especially who are buying at a discount, you know, and we have this cheap debt that we can use to do other things with, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, it's weird. Like looking at it as like the currency is, you know, like having that hard asset that's always going to be worth what it is whether or not like relative to everything else that's good or bad, at least it's still a house. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's you always know? like the population isn't shrinking across the world. I mean, maybe, maybe yeah. in some countries it's, you know, declining, but like there's always going to be more and more people, medical advancements, keep people alive longer. There's mm -hmm. less and less land available. Um, and how you're right. A house is still a house and it's still needed. And like there's, you know, part of it's just a ton of money. There's a lot of money available right now. And so people mm -hmm. are, are consuming more. It's obviously driving up inflation and it's, and so like, if I thought about this this morning while I was working out, it's like, man, if, you know, if we lost 40% equity in our properties overnight, what would that look like? It's like, that's a huge swing, 40% equity, right? We're talking housing crisis stuff, right? We'd still yeah. be okay. Yeah. You know well, I mean? even then, like, like the thing about real estate, it's not liquid enough that can necessarily happen. You know, if you're like, trying I guess, to I guess sell is what matters. Or if you if you yeah. if you're that guy that is or that investor that is buying bad deals, yeah, and you lose equity, you don't now no now you've reduced one of your exits or one of your you know yeah. abilities to create cash flow. But if you have heavily cash flowing properties, uh, regardless of the amount of equity in it, you have room to play. Unless you're getting some weird loans too, where you know they can call your loan and now you're now you're trying to sell it and you're underwater. Like there's some weird stuff there, right? But if you're making like reasonably smart decisions, because lending is getting good lending has been pretty easy since I've been, you know, buying rental properties, right? It's not, I haven't been having to get some of these hokey loans and they're underwritten, you know, decently well, um, mm -hmm. from my experience. So like, yeah, I agree. Real estate definitely seems to be a great place to be. Um, again, because like, if you do have, you know, if, if you're owning, you own Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency and it loses, you know, 40%, overnight like you've literally just lost that it's you know and if you need to mm -hmm. sell it you can't right and so you have and you don't know in the future on that sort of stuff what it looks like when it comes back exactly right but this house is still gonna be worth the house yeah you know and, and, and people you know like like i said i'm not really sure what what'll spur that in stocks or crypto or whatever but i mean it could still happen i, mean, I remember holding all my my crypto stuff back in 2018 it's funny i was actually looking at my on my coinbase account there's like you know the all time performance you can show. And it's far enough out now that the big crash that happened in 2018 like little blip. is literally just like one pixel. It's a straight line all the way down. Yeah. Cause it would happen over like a few days yep. where my portfolio dropped like 80%. Right. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's funny because I was looking at it and I was like, oh, did I like sell a bunch of stuff or something? And I was like, oh, no, that's just it tanking right. in like, you know, 72, 96 hours, or whatever it yep. was. You know, and it's like that, that could happen, right? Like, why did that happen back then? I don't know. No reason at all. But yeah, like, because the grand scale thing is just a blip in time, right? And I think that's where it goes to yeah. investing for the long term. And, you know, there's quite a few pundits out there and people that are trying to forecast the future and the crash, the next coming crash. And that's how they make their money. And it's like, you know, nobody knows what the future holds. And so, like, just make the best decisions you can for today and keep investing consistently and keep buying the deals that make sense in today's market. And over a period yeah. of time, you'll be okay. Yeah, for sure. One, and one, I think also the biggest thing as well is, um, you know, you make money when you buy, just like we've always talked about in real estate or, you know, or in stocks, like you don't necessarily want to buy it at top of the market, you know, unless you really, really believe in it over like a long-term horizon. Even then, you know, let's say you want to buy Tesla Right, you wait until Elon Musk goes and like you know sends a dick pic or something on his Twitter <laughs> and talks percent, right. right. and then you, yeah. then you go and you buy at that point. You know people are gonna bid it back yeah. up again. Yeah, exactly. Right. Wow. Um, but uh, no, it's it's interesting place to be right now. But um, I don't know. I think I think the I I'm, it, it's funny. I was listening to this other podcast um over the weekend is a is a fitness podcast i talk a lot of economics on there's a mind pump podcast and uh they were saying you know is the everyone always keeps saying like this is like the weirdest time in human history which is like a lot of this sort of stuff and they were talking out is it actually or is it just because our communication loop is now so short because it's so easy to you know learn new things like you know something happens the new omicron variant in africa we know about it in like an hour right Right. Imagine like in the forties that happened. It's like, you know, a week and a half later, right. they're like, Oh shit, this thing happened over there, you know? And, and as they also pointed out too, they're like, well, is it the weirdest times? Like what about in the forties when we were in like a world war and there was tens of thousands of people being killed in combat on like a daily basis, 
you know, I think that that's probably a stranger, more alarming time if you look at the big picture versus the stuff we have going on right now. Second connection issue for the day. Both got kicked off right there. Apparently, I, don't, I think this is the CIA not liking us talking about the economy, Dan. I agree. Yeah. Trying Either that or it's us telling us we need like a proper studio with like fiber <laughs> internet connection. This is crazy. No shit. Um, but yeah, anyway, as I was saying, was one of the guys was pointing out back when, you know, the world wars, which was, you know, in a lot of our grandparents' lifetimes still, um, you know, and tens of thousands of people were being killed in combat on like a daily basis. It's right. like, that's a slightly more alarming time than what we're going on with right now. Cause that was a completely yeah. human element. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, my, uh, my father-in-law was in town this past weekend for Thanksgiving. Um, he sent me this video. He's, he's, he's an interesting guy. Cause he's like, he grew up on a ranch in Montana by all intents and purposes. He should be like an extreme Republican type, but he's not like, he's very much like middle of the road and just like super intelligent. And he sent me this, uh, this video when he does that, it's always, I always take it with like a little bit of grain of salt. Cause you never know quite what you're going to get when your father-in-law sends you something, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> they about to be dropping some like, you know, um, systematic racism in here. Yeah. Like, like what are we talking about? <laughs> but what it was is it was an interview with this guy. He was a defector from Russia and this, it was a, on like some news channel in like the eighties. And he's basically breaking down how um, the Soviet union was taking all these steps and had been through like the sixties, seventies and eighties to basically destroy the American culture. Mm. And like, you know, like, like the very specific details about how you, you know, you start by infecting the brains of like the young and you like ruin a whole generation and then those people get into power and all sort of stuff. And it's shockingly relevant. I'm you sure know, it is. <laughs> that's now 35 years old. You know, you can go through it. Like it, it's so relevant to the point that I'm like, is this fake? Right. Because it seems way too close to home. Right? Maybe it's a deep fake that Russia created to create exactly. the situation. Right? We'll oh, see. And man. that's the thing. You don't even know. You don't even know. <laughs> yeah. With, with, with what he's talking about in the video, I'm like, well, is this part of this whole propaganda? You're just <laughs> exactly. Talking? You know, and there's, there's some yeah. Russian dude that's like, Hey, hold my beer. Watch this. Oh, man. It's like, you know, I'm going to create propaganda yeah. about the propaganda. That's going to think our propaganda is larger right. than it is. Some 13 year old dude in his parents' basements in like Turkey or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the video. You can check uh, it out. Yeah. I'll but, check it out. Put yeah. it in the show notes too, in case anybody wants to check it out. Um, but uh, I don't know, man. It's super, just a weird. Yeah, I try not to think too end of the world, right? Like, yeah. I just think you know I can only figure out what I can do today, and that's to keep investing, keep growing, because you know my the thought in the back of my head's always been like earn my way out of the problems, because yeah. regardless of what you care about, like wealthy people have have to deal with less problems than the mm -hmm. average middle class or low income person, and so. Um, if you just keep making right steps consistently every day, like you're going to, you're going to keep growing and hopefully you, you, you know, I might not own an Island someday, but if I had to, maybe I could. Well, I mean, I think that is a valid point, right? Cause if you look at who usually gets bit when stuff goes sour, you know, it's yep. not typically the hyper rich unless they're doing something pretty illegal or super right. risky. And it's not typically the poor, um, because the poor will get you know, taken care of by the government traditionally, unless you're in like countries where they don't do that and they only right. do the hyper rich, yeah. right? Like, you know, when I was in Egypt, beginning of October, talking to some of the local people there, they're like, you know, yeah. So there's basically the 1% and there's everybody else. Yeah. Like yeah. there, there is no middle class in Egypt, which is like trademark of a third world country. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, so either you want to live real simply and be on the poverty spectrum and not need a lot, or you want to be wealthy and I think if you just try to avoid the middle class as much as you can, um, as difficult as that is. Um, yep. but, uh, you know, and then at the end of the day, you gotta like, I don't know, do whatever you can to sort of escape that. And I think looking at it, being in the upper class, that's definitely more fun than being in the lower class. <laughs> <laughs> so at least a little yeah, easier, right? Honestly, <laughs> right. still have problems. Like you still deal with, you know, family issues and health issues and all that sort of stuff. But like, you know, you just have a few less problems. Yeah, exactly. Right. At least, at least you, know, you can generally know where your next meal is going to come from. Exactly. But yeah, I don't know. It's 
it, it, I mean, it, it's it's interesting because I know in, in GoBundance too, you've seen this where there's a lot of very successful people and they like fixate on the end of the world stuff and they mm-hmm. worry about it so constantly. Yeah, and it's like I think it's important to be cognizant of what you need to do to help deter that. But at the same time, if you let it kind of be what your obsession is, that gets pretty unhealthy pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. It seems so, like, like if, if you have that feeling, but at least you're still doing all the right things to enjoy life today and you're still making business decisions as long as that, as if that wasn't going to happen, I think you're okay. But if you're like rearranging your life and like spending money on bunkers and shit, like you might be going a little extreme if you're, if you're hindering your growth or hindering your, your, your family or your livelihood because of it. Yeah. And yeah. then that's where it turns into a cult. Exactly. Right. <laughs> well, you become one of those weird conspiracy people. You right. Know, the, yeah. Like the, the QAnon. What were they doing yeah. in, uh, was it in DC somewhere? I, I don't know. I don't, I forget which city it was, but they were all there waiting for John F. Kennedy's son or brother or some shit to show up. A guy who died like 40 years ago. One of the Kennedys who was going to, was going to show up and reclaim the White House for Trump. Wow. And there was like literally people that were out there for weeks yeah. because some dude like posts, you know, the QAnon person who has, been a part he was an individual who came out from one of the forums and admitted he started as a joke to basically <laughs> take advantage of these stupid people some some when, left-wing troll that's just like this is yeah, great <laughs> seriously, he, he did he like felt bad about it and came out with all this stuff and then something came up in their circles that one of the kennedys was going to come and reclaim the white house for trump and like wow. hundreds of people went and were like camping out in this area yeah. waiting for him that's great. Wow. Like what? That's like, oh my God. Then you see that and you're like, <laughs> that makes you a little bit worried for society. Right yeah. But yeah, I'm fascinating. All right. Um, well, there's our, our political podcast. In case you can't tell, we're pretty middle of the road and don't yeah. really care about anything. So, um, <laughs> but uh, you got any good lessons learned this past week, Dan? Um, gosh, it was, you know, holiday week. Um, so it was a little, little weird, but um, I had an aha it's, you know, really about like developing employees and like finding like systems that you, you know, we're constantly always in, in real estate. You're always talking about systems because everybody wants to be able to do the four hour work week or pull out and like, you know, have their, their business run efficiently. And there's like two types of employees. There's like the one you hire to build your systems, which is like typically a higher rate, you know, and they have some skill sets and they're good at that. Yeah. And then there's others that can operate within a system and do really well. Um, I definitely feel like on the property management and on the, um, construction side of things, um, I've been trying to get people to help build the system or thinking of it in that way, where really I just need to give them the system and and keep them to it. Um, because those employees typically, at least the way that we've hired, um, really aren't the kind of people that can build a system or that you can trust to build a good system. And so thinking about it in that sense, you know, for other people out there trying to do the same thing is, recognizing when it's something, when it's a system you can build and you're going to pay somebody less to operate within that system, or is it a system that you can't build because you don't have the skills and you need somebody to do it for you. And you're going to have to typically pay them higher and they're going to have higher expectations for a future um, within the company. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's super valid and I've, I've sort of come with that um, as we've uh, you know, I've built out the acquisition side as well is, you know, systematizing things that need to be systematized. I mean, and that was one of the mistakes we made with our first acquisitions manager as well, was we were paying her like she was going to be building the system and then found out she was not capable of doing so. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, that was just, so that ended up with her paying, us paying her too much for the role that she had and it became more of a headache than anything else. And now with our new team, we've adjusted that where we're paying more appropriately to be the operator mm-hmm. and not the person at the top. But, um, you know, which I mean, we do have more experience now to be able to build that a little bit better, but right. I think that is critical. And then, you know, it's like, so down the line, we bring on a, um, COO or something like that, that's going to sort of run the ship or, you know, our, let's say one of our employees right now steps up to that role. Like, what does that look like? And then what is the appropriate way to pay that person and sort of structure that job? Um, is, I mean, it's like, it's almost like getting middle management in place, right. At that point but you want them to be more, what's the right word? Not like necessarily middle management, like a, like a giant company, but have more of like a leadership role yep. while still also making sure that they're 
you know, staying within their bounds, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's, it's one of the, yeah, it's, um, like I've seen other, other companies, um, uh, be successful at hiring kind of that, you know, maybe you call it an operations manager or whatever, where they get a person that has that skill set to build systems. And I, you know, I think the I, ideal situation is where you are, you know, owning and running your business. And then you get to pick the things that you're passionate about and like to do and enjoy mm-hmm. doing. Once you get to that level, then you can hire those other people to do either system building. Maybe you're just like a salesperson. You just want to do sales. You're really good at it. You could give a shit about systems, but you know, you need it. You can hire mm-hmm. that like high, um, high powered, higher paid individual. That's like, I love building systems. I'm going to tear it apart, you know, process engineer type folks and build that for you. So you can do what you love. Yeah. Right. As opposed to doing everything in the company, when you start out, we're, you know, you're doing everything. Right. Yeah. And so it's really challenging and just recognizing which employees are capable of building systems and which ones are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's just personality types too. There's a lot to that, but you know, at the same time, you know, you say the stuff that you don't want to do outsource it. It's like that who, not how method. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know who read that book, but I mean, it's the same sort of like people, Dan employees. Was Dan Sullivan wrote that yep. book? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people who are your employees have the same sort of stuff. They're going to have the same things that they like to do and that they don't like to do. And just because yep. they're not an entrepreneur per se doesn't mean they're exempt from that. True. So good point. That's important thing to consider. But. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. Um, you can follow us on socials at Collecting Keys Podcast. Um, I meant to get more stuff done with the website this weekend and then I failed to do so. Um, but, uh, collectingkeyspodcast.com is where that's going to be here shortly. And then you can follow me directly on Instagram at Mike underscore invest. You can follow Dan at investor man, Dan, and anything else I need to say? No, I think that's it. Hit us up in the DMS. If you figured out, uh, the, uh, solution for the key collecting problem we have. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, do that. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, subscribe and, uh, give us a review or shoot us a message. Let us know what you think. And talk to you guys next week. All right. See ya. See ya. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at collectingkeyspodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.